Hi, I'm Taco. Uh, you probably don't know me, but... Did I hit the recording? Oh my god, oh my god. You probably don't know me, but if you do, it's likely from talking about Pokemon on Twitter, among a few other things like pixel art and... What else do I do? Post obscure lore about video games? Unfortunately, for me, I guess a lot of other people, but unfortunately for me, my main hangout, Twitter, is currently imploding right now. So, I thought now would probably be a good time to start a YouTube channel. I was going to anyways, but the impending doomsday of Twitter kind of sped that up a lot. I was gonna take a month to make this video, now it's, now it's taking me three days. I have never written so many words, even in my history of procrastinating to the last second in high school and college, I have never written so many words in such a short amount of time. I am so full of coffee and so not full of sleep. But don't worry. <laughs> but don't worry. <laughs> uh, hold on, I lost my place. But don't worry. The research itself for this video took me months and was already done. It's the video production quality itself that's gonna be like, you know, kind of scrappy, you know, big duct tape taped over, right? If you were to see my word count, or the length of this video, I think you'd agree I don't have enough time to proofread my script before this video needs to exist. So, think of it as a fun game where we get to experience my typos and shortcuts together. You may also realize I'm reading directly from Google Docs, who's got time to memorize all of this when I just wrote it an hour ago. But, you know, it's kind of like a race to see what happens first, right? This video finishing or Twitter breaking. Only you, the viewer, in the future will know. <laughs> Alright, so, what is this video about? Well, I can tell you what this video is not going to be about. All of the stuff you already know. This isn't a summary of the game's main story, or a list of, these are all the ancestors, or a list of the Pokedex entries, although I will be referring to some of them when necessary. This also isn't about Pokemon theories, or what ifs. You know, what ifs, like what What if this happens, and then what if this happens? But I will be theorizing, and I will not know the answers to the questions, and I will have guesses, but we are going for finding what hidden story is specifically intended to be found, which will make a whole lot more sense the more we talk about it. Think of it as like story math. Story beat plus story beat equals, um, uh, you're my long lost brother! I, I don't know, I made that up. But the point is, we are finding those story beats to hopefully discover an intended to be found hidden storyline and lore in Pokemon. So, the building blocks of figuring any of this hidden story are observations. You, you collect enough straightforward observations and a bigger story will form. Again, we're not looking to theorize based on what ifs, which by the way, are fine. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just not what we're doing. Uh, we're trying to find what the developers more clearly put into the game. Think of our observations as puzzle pieces. Now, I know some of you probably think that would be a very straightforward thing to do, but we got to understand that most people assume, especially in a for all ages game like Pokemon, that there's nothing really to look for, or in some cases in the fandom, uh, we overthink it. So they don't see it, or they pass right over the obvious answers. I get it. So, to start with, we are going to make some simple observations that we can all agree on, so we can all be on the same page. First off, Pokemon animations. All of the Pokemon obviously have their own animations, but quite a few of them have really specific and unique details to them. My favorite of them is Sudowoodo. In general, the thing Sudowoodo is known for is acting like a fake tree, but in reality they are a rock type, and a lot more alive. Pseudo, fake, wudo, wood, fake wood, right? Anyways, so in Legends Arceus, if you look at it from a distance, or if you sneak up on it without it seeing you, it'll have its arms down. Once it finally sees you, tree mode. Very smooth, you fooled me. But this isn't the only case of unique detail. Chansey will rush over to heal you if you get hurt nearby. Mr. Mime will mime the relaxing and drinking pose from Detective Pikachu. And Nosepass will always face north, just like it says in the Pokedex. Like, when you see it. Like, obviously, if you're battling, it'll turn around. It doesn't end there. As a bit of setup, when you throw a Pokemon into the water, most of the time, it'll either stand on a flotation device, fly, or especially if it's a water Pokemon, it'll swim. There are exceptions to this. 
Normally, Decidueye stands, so you might assume when thrown into the water, it would stand on a flotation device. But you'll be surprised to find out this is a cool way to see its flying animation. I'd also like to point out Vaporeon. As a water type, you'd assume it would swim, but for some reason, that's not the case. It stands on a flotation device. Why is that? Well, if you look at one of its Pokedex entries, it says its cell structure is similar to water and will melt away and become invisible if it touches water. That's why it ain't touching it. This is just this first set of observations, but honestly, I think you could make an entire video out of just these types of observations and say this is enough proof to show the developers are intentionally putting a lot of care and accuracy into easily missable details. But, you know, we're just getting started. There are many other things you can observe about the Pokemon. If you're getting close, or you have the light hit just right, you'll realize even before Scarlet and Violet, and just like in new Pokemon Snap before it, the Pokemon are much more detailed now. You can see past Collegian scales. Another example, there's my first shortcut, <laughs> and my favorite, the brown and Pikachu's eyes. Next, <laughs> next, if you've seen or played any part of this game, you'll know there are a lot of aggressive Pokemon. But did you know some Pokemon are basically willing to be caught? They might not give a free catch when you throw a Pokeball, but they'll stand there happily waiting for you until you try. Some Pokemon are so chill that they'll actually play with you by walking and jumping around you. Your character will even recognize this and smile back. Now, these next two Pokemon related observations don't really fit well as examples, but I wanted to bring them up anyway, so you can throw your Pokemon at some of the roofs, even the big ones. I don't know, you can take some pictures, have a kaiju battle, uh, uh, whatever. Uh, and in this one scene, when you are trying to save the lady from Paris, if you fail, she'll get attacked and scream. And time will reset, implying that, you know, it's so bad, you aren't able to keep trying to help her past this point of no return. And if she's not dead, in a game where they constantly remind you that Pokemon can kill you, she is at the very least not okay. All right, anyways, back on track. Let's start talking about environmental storytelling. Yes, yes, Pokemon has that. Yes, I know the environment is not the prettiest, but there is still environmental storytelling happening. In fact, there has been environmental storytelling in Pokemon since the beginning, but that's gonna be a whole other video in the future. Now remember, we're starting with easy and agreeable examples so that we're all on the same page that they exist. The examples I'm about to give aren't gonna blow your mind, but we gotta lay a foundation. Speaking of a foundation, and a building being built on top of it, the Galaxy Hall, that was, that was not very smooth. If you go inside, you can actually see the wooden Pokeballs being made step by step, being carved, being painted, being assembled, all of it, even some schematics. I think that's pretty cool. Speaking of the building, you'll learn the Pokeballs are made by the Supply Corps. In fact, walking outside of the room, you'll see this has a color-coded green sign of the Supply Corps above the door, and that all of the other rooms are all color-coordinated to the different corps. Security, Agriculture, Construction, Medical, and Survey Corps. Now, let's go outside the Galaxy Hall door and look at the surrounding housing. They too are color-coordinated to which corps each person works under. And as the game goes on, you have probably already noticed that the town gradually gets built up and more buildings appear. Now, if that's not impressive enough, I get it, you can take this even deeper by recognizing that the Galaxy Hall is based on the former Hokkaido government office in Sapporo, Japan, and that it gives you a pretty solid time frame that this game takes place around 1871. Just like then, you two are surveying the land of Hokkaido, or in the Pokemon World's version, Hisui. Basing locations off of real life locations is an ongoing aspect of Pokemon, something they've encouraged looking into many times before, like their UK Galar tour during Sword and Shield. There are layers to this environmental storytelling, and you'll see, they all matter. Let's follow a different series of observations for now, though. Your Pokedex, as time goes on, will actually gradually gain wear and tear. That's not the relevant part, though, because the relevant part is when you open the Pokedex and actually read it. Over time, you may have picked up that the Pokedex entries themselves are not written by you, but instead, Professor Lavington. How do we know this? Well, here are a few examples. There's nothing written in this. I'm gonna just look it up online. <laughs> Hold on. I have examples on my phone. Hold on. I I did write examples down. Example one, Psyduck. Suffers perpetual headaches. If the agony grows too great, Psyduck's latent power erupts, contrary to Psyduck's intent. 
Ergo, I am exploring ways to ease the pain. Notice the eye there, sample number two, and see if you can guess this one, all right? A feeble, pitiful imbecile of a Pokemon that is nonetheless very hardy. Unperturbed by turbid water, it can be found living in all sorts of places. That would be Magikarp. My favorite example, however, is the Raichu entry. Not only is this a kind of retcon of the original Raichu Pokedex entry that mentions an Indian elephant, but it gives a hint to which region the professor is from. Where is that region, you may ask? Well, if all the fancy professor words like botheration didn't give it away, or my terrible attempt at an accent, the elephant might narrow it down. I have to get rid of the accent. I almost did it again. The elephant might narrow it down to one of two likely options. That retcon I mentioned might make you think it is an unknown Indian region, since it's a replacement of an Indian elephant. But we also already know the Kaparaja is from a known region, Gallon. In fact, let's add an additional observation to seal the deal. In the professor's lab, if you look at his chalkboard, he actually writes in a different language than the one seen throughout Legends Arceus. The professor's written language just so happens to be the same from Galar. So yeah, although I don't believe his region was ever stated outright, there is a number of ways you could have comfortably assumed Lavington was from Galar. But it is nice to know the game left enough clues to add up to a bigger picture. Future Editor Taco here. As I was finding music for this video and going through the entire, you know, Pokemon Legends Arceus soundtrack again, uh, I realized the song, Chat with the Professor, actually sounds a heck of a lot like a certain town from Pokemon Sword and Shield called Postwick. Here, take a listen. Right? Right? So, if we want to take it one step further, we might even know which town he came from. You know, the starting town of Pokemon Sword and Shield, Postwick. Cool, anyways, all right. Going back to past taco, past recorded taco. That's really what the entire point of this video is, uh, to show that this sort of puzzle piece scenario is all over the place. Here's the thing though. Needing to know a little bit about Sword and Shield in that last example, or that the Hisuian region and Galaxy Hall are based on real life, are just a few instances of many that these puzzle pieces are not all self-contained to this one game. In hindsight, little old Benny giving you the recipe to smoke bombs early in the game might have tipped you off to him being a ninja. But if you had played any of the Hoenn games before and met the shy, timid boy Wally, then a combination of Benny's green hair peeking out and his restaurant being named the Wallflower, Wally Flower, Wallflower Shy, might have given away that he was Wally's ancestor long before the more obvious hairstyle reveal. Oh, why did I flip my hair? Okay, let's leave the games and go even further out then. On the website, you can learn even more lore about the Pokemon. Did you know Hisuian Voltorb is considered a nuisance? Tales of people temporarily plugging the hole on Hisuian Voltorb's head and kicking it out of the settlements are not entirely uncommon. That is exclusive to the website. What about art books and strategy guides? Yup, there's lore in those too. In the game itself, you will learn that Adamant and Mai have a younger brother, older sister dynamic. Well, in this art book, whoop, you can see it. Whoop, look at this, whoop, right there. Look at those two. Look at those two. Oh, maybe I'll put a better image on top. <laughs> this art book. You can also see, hold on, hold on. I mean, I just cut this out. You will also see Silene's Fear of Bugs. Is it working? Whoa. Professor Livington without his hat. Oh, right here. There it is. Ah. Or let's switch art books. Whew. This is a guidebook with art in it. You can see Ingo without a hat. Ooh. And although it is very much separate can into that of the games, you can find uh, elaborations, for lack of a better term, of game concepts in the main Pokemon anime as well. For instance, in the special Arceus episode, if you had any doubts 
Go points out that the Hisuian Pokemon are in fact dead. They all died out. It doesn't mean there can't be like, you know, a non-Hisuian Sneasler later on, but the Hisuian Pokemon, they died. <laughs> I mean, like, if fossils come back. Anyways, to sum up this beginning section, we can now all agree there are intentional details with the Pokemon themselves, the environments, the characters, links to other games, canon extended media, other adaptations, such as the separate canon main anime, and even real life that can all play a part in Pokemon's greater story. These are our tools, our puzzle pieces. They don't always link up, and I personally don't know the answers to all of them. I'm only one guy. But I do have a few stories to share with you that I have confidently put together. Something bothered me. At the beginning of the game, when you suddenly arrived with no warning through a time and space portal in a town that was still in the middle of gathering supplies and being built, they somehow had spare housing for the player. They even mentioned that maybe they should build more housing just in case more people show up out of the blue. So it definitely sounds like they weren't prepared, right? So there had to be a reason they just happened to have a spare room. They didn't just build it for you on the spot and they probably aren't wasting perfectly good shelter, right? Well, before you even answer, yes. Yes, this could just very well be a video gamey thing. You needed a player house, you got a player house. It's not that deep. I agree, that is a possibility. If I can't confirm something, which is the case in this story and many others in many other video games that I'll talk about on this channel, I'm not gonna. Because it's more about finding the puzzle pieces and figuring out how they might fit together rather than forcing an answer for the sake of, I want to be the one to find the answer, right? So after digging around with this in mind, I, at the very least, came up with a couple other possibilities. One of the first things I'll point out is that the concept art of the Survey Corps housing goes out of its way to point out that the player's room was barely used before you got there. Oh wait, I can show that. Hold on. To me, that's already hit something more is going on. Why isn't the room being used by an existing surgery, surgery Corps member? Survey Corps member. Before you showed up, there were three Survey Corps members and three houses. So why was one empty? Well, maybe we can learn a few additional details from this concept art, which I'm realizing I shouldn't have put away. Like how the concept art itself, hold on. Just like all the other concept art, I actually switched over to a, like a free teleprompter. It's moving on its own. Isn't always representative of the final inclusion in the game. Here, the player housing is in the middle, over here, is in the middle, rather than on the left side in the final game, which isn't a big deal. Am I talking, which isn't a big deal, but one of my original guesses is that the potential possibility was that one of the rooms you moved into was used for storage. But as you can see, the storagey look likely will had nothing to do with your room to begin with, since it was already like that for a separate room in an earlier planning stage. It could be. But I'm okay not continuing down that path for now. Another detail we can learn from this concept art, gosh dang it. <laughs> Another detail we can learn from this concept art is that the rooms are actually labeled. Like I mentioned, other than you, there are three Survey Corps members. And you can see here that the red one is Captain Silene's room. The one with only one sign is yours. And the other one apparently has four people in it. Even though that many Survey Corps members don't exist, does this imply that your rival, for lack of a better way to simplify Ray or Kari, because it changes depending on who you are, the professor and two other mystery people live in the same house? Well, let's add another puzzle piece to the mix, which is the fact that the professor doesn't live in any of the Survey Corps houses. He actually sleeps in his office. You can see he's been sleeping on the couch and he has his own kotatsu, right? The little table. So does that mean your room was originally his room and he just doesn't use it? Maybe, that's another one of the possibilities. It's odd that he never brought it up since he was right there when you were offered the housing, but I don't think that makes it any less of a possibility. So, so far, that means we know where the captain lives, where you live, where the professor lives, and we can safely guess where your rival lives. But if you're keeping track, we still have six signs and only four people to account for them, including yourself. And that might not even be accurate because those signs could have been there before you showed up. So I wasn't satisfied. Was there maybe any Survey Corps members that we missed? Turns out, the answer is yes. Remember the Misfortune Sisters? And how they were all previously from different groups? 
At first, I thought Charm could have been the one that was previously a Survey Corps member because she was from the Galaxy team. But it turns out, if you look closer at her uniform, that she was part of the construction crew. Actually, if you look at the other sisters' outfits, you can tell where they're from, too. Clover is from the Diamond Clan, and Coin is from the Pearl Clan. So dead end, right? Wrong! Because the other two sisters also joined the Galaxy team after leaving their own clans, too. A Diamond Clan NPC, at one point, which I'm not gonna go find again, says, Clover used to be in the Survey Corps with the Galaxy team. I wonder what she's doing now. I, I, I double-checked on Bumblepedia. It exists. Which gives us another possibility right there. The barely used house could have been Clover's. And to add fuel to this, the Galaxy team has wanted posters of the Bandit Sisters. And Clover and Coin's pictures are not quite right compared to Charms. Which might be a possible hint that those two weren't a part of the team for very long. This scenario might also explain why everyone at the beginning of the game is so hesitant to let in an outsider. Because clearly, they just had issues with outsiders showing up, joining the team, which they were fine with previously, previously fine with letting people join the team, but then stealing a bunch of their stuff and forming the Misfortune Sisters. Taking another look at their outfits, you will notice Coin was a part of the Orange Agriculture Corps. That's hard to say. You can see that they stole Security Corps rope thingies, likely the Pokeballs hanging from them, and you can even tell by Clover's satchel and jacket that they hit the Ginkgo Guild, which, according to Volo, has happened a bunch of times. So there you have it, our three possibilities. One, it's not that deep. Two, it's the professors, he's just so wrapped up in his work that he doesn't use it. Or three, it's Clover's, she just bailed early on. Heck, it could even be the professors and then Clover's and then yours. That still doesn't explain the mystery people in your rival's room. But maybe that's just her family. I, I mean like, you know, she's a kid, right? One last thing though. For some reason, there is a jar of rocks in your room when you originally arrive that are labeled as pretty, but then the game goes out of its way to say they're worthless. This is obviously supposed to mean something. Uh, I don't know what it means. I don't know everything. So maybe one of you guys will. I almost wonder if this might be another additional hint that this was, I put Candace. It's not supposed to be Candace. It's supposed to be Clover, Clover's room <laughs> and, her, and her rocks because she seems to be the one most interested in procuring valuable goods. And later you will find out she's super into finding treasures only to later realize it can't make her money. But that's just a guess on my part. Uh, feels kind of like a stretch, or at the very least, it's something uh, you should take with a giant grain of salt, right? I, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. That's the fun of this. I don't know the exact answer, but it led me to finding out a lot more and realizing there's a lot of intentional things going on, regardless if they led to answering whose room it was before yours or not. Moving on. Is it getting lighter out? Oh no. I gotta hurry. I gotta hurry! Most of this entire next section will take place outside of the game. We are going to be dissecting the extended canon anime, Hisuian Snow. Yes, this is canon, and no, this isn't the first time Pokemon has used other mediums to elaborate on the story. How do we know when something is canon to the game's universe? Well, there are a few different signs, like how game universe Pokemon don't say their names. But the surefire way to determine this is when the anime events tie into the games themselves. In Twilight Wings, before we even had access to the DLC, there was an episode where B was training in what looked like the Isle of Armor. Turns out it was. Once the DLC released, on occasion which didn't ever happen to me, you can find B doing her training on the Isle of Armor. Once you realize Hisuian Snow is also canon, you can actually learn quite a bit from it. Like how it was the French who bullied Zorua and Zoroark out of the country and into Hisui to become scary, vengeful ghosts. I, I thought it was America's fault. Because, like, they're Gen 5 Pokemon, right? And, and would any of us be surprised if it was our fault? But in the brief flashback, you can actually see the mountain from Kalos. That was... I was supposed to label which mountain that was. I didn't do that. <laughs> oh, there it is. Um, which is also the first region where you can find Zoroark in the wild. If you've seen the series, it's pretty easy to tell that it takes place before the player's arrival. Keeping that in mind, you can flesh out a lot of what was happening in Jubilife Village at the time. You can see the Galaxy Hall being in an even earlier stage of being built than when you start the game, and judging by Silene's outfit, she is not a Survey Corps captain, but is instead a part of the Security Corps. I don't think there even is a Survey Corps yet. There's no professor either, which I'll touch on more in just a moment. At the beginning of the series, the main character, Alec, 
is visiting Hisui with his father in a time before Jubilife Village, which is really cool to see. We know this because after Alec returns, his father says it has been three years after Alec left to become a doctor, and that he moved here soon after. What's really cool is that implies Alec's father was there at the beginning of Jubilife's establishment, since Jubilife has only been around for two years by the time you arrive, the player character. Actually, you can find Alec's father because he's in the game. It's this guy, Anvin. The Crassin dude, like Anvil, right? Anyways, the anime even has him in the exact same location because you can see the fence to the training grounds from his workshop in both versions. You can even get the mask that he gives his son in the Daybreak DLC update. Since we're already talking about game connections, Alex seems to still be around too because you can bump into him as a traveling doctor in the game, which also didn't happen to me, even though I tried. He even makes reference to when he visited 10 years ago as a kid, and he shares the same NPC model as his father, which is a really cool, neat detail in my opinion. Now this is where our story starts to form. All of these little things that we're noticing start to have implications on the wider story of Pokemon Legends Arceus. In the final episode, you see that not only were the time and space distortions already happening before your arrival, but that the villagers were all still very against interacting with Pokemon, even Silene. Again, the Survey Corps does not seem to be a thing, and I don't see any of the Security Corps wielding Pokemon on their little rope thingies. If it wasn't for Alec showing his care for Pokemon, nobody in Jubilife would have given them a chance. They just planned to leave them hurt outside. Once Alec did help more Pokemon, and the Jubilife gang saw the error in their ways, you can even see that the Abra Silene has later on seems to have been one of those hurt Pokemon. Is this also what inspired the Survey Corps? Because in the end credits, Silene, who is now open to Pokemon, is rocking a Survey Corps outfit and is there to greet none other than Professor Lavington at the dock. How about that? So basically, this one kid who grew to love Pokemon because of one Zorua in this lower profile web anime that seems to have very little to do with the main story of Pokemon Legends on the surface might actually be the origin story of many significant parts of Pokemon history. He's the kickstart. Heck, him convincing his dad Pokemon aren't half bad seems to have led to the invention of the Pokeshi doll which is likely what led to the iconic Poké Doll. Dang, that's a lot of implications. Time and space travel are not new to Pokémon. All of these things, they've been around. Celebi can time travel all the way back in Gen 2. Hoopa can Hoopa you through dimensions. There are a whole class of alien Pokémon traveling interdimensionally and scooping people up. And my goodness, Diamond, Pearl, Platinum, Brilliant Diamond, and Shining Pearl all have poster children that are all about time and space. So surprise, surprise, Pokemon Legends Arceus, another in this long line of Sinnoh-related games, is also about time and space. Now, if you didn't guess this game was going to be about time and space, from the titular Pokemon alone, Arceus, the god who literally creates new dimensions, and gave Palkia, Dialga, and Giratina their time and space powers, there was another pretty big hint something time and space related was going on from the reveal trailer. The Pokeballs. If we are right about the general time frame Legends Arceus takes place, there should not be Pokeballs. And yet, here they are. Guy from game, oh, that was supposed to be, I was supposed to change that. Guy from Game says Pokeball. I'll just put it up. Guy from Game says Pokeballs weren't around when he was a kid, and unless he is crazy, crazy old, which okay is not impossible in the world of Pokemon, I just don't think it's the case this time. Pokeballs should not be here this early, and yet here they are. Most people took this as a retcon. Like I said, a lot of people don't think there is a consistent story in Pokemon or a story at all. So instead of thinking it was an intentional inconsistency to like you know make alarm bells go off. They immediately think this inconsistency is a mistake or that the devs don't care about the lore. Uh -uh -uh. Uh -uh -uh. If you're like me, your actual first thought was, oh, there's some time and space shenanigans going on right now. This led to a series of six predictions I made, which I began coming up with on day one, that all came true. Three of those predictions were unrelated. One, that the starters would get new evolutions. 
Two, that legendaries would get new forms. I think the legendaries might get a new form. And three, that there would be at least one new Pokemon not tied to an evolution. But two of those predictions were directly tied with time and space shenanigans. A, that this game would be about time and space shenanigans. And B, because this game was about time and space shenanigans, we would get an impossible Pokemon. Pokemon that shouldn't exist yet, according to the lore, that the developers do follow, like Mewtwo, Sil Valley, or Porygon. Fast forward to another trailer, and suddenly we are introduced to something called an Arc Phone. Now, I'm not gonna call anyone out, but it is very easy to find more people acting like, whoa, Pokemon is so weird. They don't make any sense with their lore. They don't care. Uh uh. Uh uh. Uh uh. No. It makes sense, alright. I mean, yeah, it is weird, but it is consistently weird. Again, I was screaming from the rooftops that this was about time and space shenanigans. And this sealed the deal for me. But here's the thing. If you're watching this video, and you've watched this far, you probably already played the game, because that's, that's the only way this video makes any sense. Which then means you already know this game is filled with time and space shenanigans. So, what exactly am I trying to convince you of? I mean, the very first thing that happens in Legends Arceus is sending a modern day kid through time and space with their cell phone. None of this is new news. It's not a reveal. So what's my point? Throughout this video, I keep mentioning things that are not new to Pokemon, like the different ways they tell stories, or a bunch of the sci-fi elements they have never shied away from, or the fact that there even is a story and that it's consistent. But if I thought that was common knowledge, I don't think I would want to make this video. There's lots I'm leaving out because everyone else already talked about it in YouTube videos, like all the ancestors, or like the top 10 endings explained kind of thing, right? I don't want to talk about the stuff everyone already knows. But at this point, with hindsight, none of my predictions seem like a big deal either. But they all were at the time. Most of them went viral because no one else had predicted them. And they had plenty of, that makes no sense, pushback. I'm not saying this to brag. I got that out of the way at the beginning of the year. I'm bringing this up to say, you can do this too. Actually, you can do this with a lot of game series. If people knew any of this was intentionally going on or didn't assume it wasn't going on, all of this would have been more obvious ahead of time. Or at least would have made an exclamation point go off over your head, right? Right? But I have to get this out of the way because someone has to. And don't get me wrong, there are plenty of people out there who have cared this entire time. I follow them on Twitter. I might not be able to much longer, but it is, it's, <laughs> But it's not common knowledge, not even between core Pokemon fans, especially before the days of Pokemon Masters, but that's a video for another time. So now that we know it exists, let's make it common knowledge, because I'd rather talk about even nerdier stuff. I want to be so in the weeds about stuff on here that no one outside of a percent of a percent want to talk about. But people have to recognize this stuff exists in the first place for us to even start going deeper. This applies to a bunch of different series. Sonic fans, which is also me, are currently so stoked about the lore feeling recognized in Sonic Frontiers when it is not controversial to say most people don't care about Sonic's story. Or again, realize story even exists, which caused a lot of back and forth online. <laughs> if more people knew it existed, more people would see how cool aspects of Sonic Frontiers was. The same goes for Pokemon. The same goes for Digimon. The same goes for Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin, which I'm pretty sure is very canon and you should play that game. I care about the canon lore the creator's intent, and even more about the creators themselves regarding all of my favorite series. So much so that I actually started a lore library, which is a big old list of my favorite series, a Patreon-only Discord, a series of streams, and this YouTube channel starting with this video. Just to go through all of those games again, and more, like stuff that inspired those games, while also inviting you guys to help figure it all out with me because I want more people to see how fun it is to let themselves care, no matter how dumb a game seems about what the developers were trying to get at with their series. Let's meet games halfway. This doesn't mean you have to like every game. A lot of my favorite series have games I don't like, including Pokemon. But if you let the game show you what it's trying to show you, there is so much cool stuff going on. We don't have to wait for hindsight to show up and can be rewarded for giving games a fair shake. That really is my point. But before we move on to the next part, 
I actually have a favorite something worth sharing about time and space shenanigans. But first, let me list off some other points just to scratch that itch a little bit more. There's time and space distortions everywhere. In those time and space distortions, you can find future Pokemon that you can't find elsewhere, like Porygon. Freaking knew it! Oh my god! And Pokemon that require special future items to evolve, which the future item descriptions and Pokedex entries of said future Pokemon hint they're not from this time. Let me read one. A curious item induced this evolution. Huh? Curious item induced this evolution. The Pokemon's offensive capabilities have greatly increased, but the strangeness of its behavior has magnified in equal measure. This worries me. Good old Professor Lavington. Back to the list. You can find, I don't know what number we're on. We, you can find future only evolutions the closer you get to Mount Cornet because they are spilling out of the time and space distortion above it. A little more unspoken environmental storytelling for you. Ingo is from Black and White, a completely separate world where Hisui didn't exist. He's even wearing his old clothes and is slowly remembering stuff from his past, like his brother. And if you don't have a Rotom with you, you can, as a future kid, recognize the future appliances that Rotom would possess by interacting with them. There are more examples, but I want to point out my favorite example of time and space shenanigans. You, the player, are not Rei or Akari. Rei and Akari are the characters who are already living in the past when you get there. You are from the future, not the past. On the Pokemon website, it lists these characters as you or Rei or Akari. You, the player character, are separate from Rei or Akari. You as a future person, have caught and used Pokemon before. You, from the future, know what a Pokemon contest is. You, from the future, agree with Ingo about being from a different world. You, according to Silene, are about 15-ish years old, which is not typical for a Pokemon protagonist, who are typically 11-ish years old in the game series. And if we've learned anything during this video, it's that Pokemon has a way of just saying things for a reason, no matter how awkwardly they say it. You, according to data mine material, used to have the same room as Don and Lucas from Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. That's the thing. You are either Don or Lucas from Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. Time has passed. You are no longer 11-ish. You are 15-ish. You've done this before. That's why Arceus chose you. Pokemon Legends Arceus is actually a sequel to Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. Uh, I, I, I wrote a, a woo, but I'm not, I didn't commit. Don't get me wrong, Pokemon Legends Arceus is still a prequel, but it's a prequel to Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, which you can tie together with the old Manaphy book that is unique to BDSP's library that leads to a side quest in Legends Arceus. And this NPC in Legends Arceus, who happens to be the dude making all those statues that you end up digging up underground in BDSP. Pretty neat. Okay. Okay. I have to come clean. I lied. I don't know which Diamond and Pearl this is a sequel to. It is a sequel to that story, and yes, it could be a sequel to the original Diamond and Pearl, or Platinum, but I don't know that for sure. It could be instead circular, and be a prequel and a sequel to BDSP, but that doesn't quite add up timeline-wise, which I'll talk about in that other video I keep saying I'll talk about later. Hint, hint, wink, wink, please subscribe. But I think there might be a secret third possibility. See, between every game getting a COVID delay in 2021, the fact that Pokemon Legends Arceus and BDSP had a later promotional cycle than usual, the fact that Pokemon Legends Arceus was in development a little longer than the typical three-year cycle that Pokemon Legends Arceus came out in January instead of fall, which is really weird for a high-profile series since fall is the big buying season. The fact that Game Freak didn't release anything in 2021. Go back, check. They didn't release anything. And especially because Game Freak is releasing another Pokemon game in the year 2022. This year, I think there's a decent possibility Pokemon Legends Arceus was originally supposed to be the fall 2021 game, but got internally delayed. Why does that matter? Well, it matters for other actually important reasons, but I'm gonna give a dumb reason why it matters instead. We all know Pokemon Diamond and Pearl take place three years after Ruby and Sapphire, right? 
Right. And we all know the protagonists of Pokemon Legends Arceus are 15-ish, right? Right. Well, Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire were released in 2014. And if Don and Lucas were 11 years old, three years after in 2017, then four years later, they would be 15 in 2021. I'm telling you, Pokemon is pretty decent at sticking with its own lore. There is a non-zero chance Pokemon Legends Arceus is a sequel to a Pokemon Diamond and Pearl we never got that follows the separate timeline set up for Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. Listen, even if my guess about Arceus being internally delayed is wrong, which means it's delayed before they announce a date, and it is just a guess, a, a guess, that I had long before coming up with this dumb reason, Silene says you look about 15, which hey, unless your birthday's in January, it's still true. But I have some terrible news. I lied to you again. Some of my more perceptive viewers may have noticed earlier I said I made six predictions, but only talked about five of them, and that two of them were about time and space shenanigans. Well, that's where the lies come in. Three of my predictions, not two, were about time and space shenanigans, and Arceus being a sequel to Diamond and Pearl was not my favorite example. My prediction, and my favorite time and space shenanigan, is that Pokemon Legends Arceus is actually a capital R Game Freak remake of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. Before we continue any further, I need to say that I will be spoiling the game Final Fantasy VII Remake in this next part. If you haven't played the game and you don't want to be spoiled, go ahead and skip to the next chapter. I completely, completely understand. Okay? W waiting? Giving some people enough time to fish their phones out of their pockets to skip. Okay? Alright, still here? Good. Okay. I'm going to show you what is the most fun prediction I have ever made. On day one, right after the reveal, with very little information to go off of. That if you follow me on Twitter, you saw me retweet every time I got more relevant with each trailer. And then I lost it when I found out I was right. Pokemon VDSP is a remake of Diamond and Pearl, while Pokemon Legends Arceus is a remake of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. Okay, I'm not gonna expect everyone to get this right away. This tweet was for me, so don't worry, I, I will explain. Now, I want to begin with saying yes, I, I agree. Pokemon Legends Arceus is not what we expect from a Game Freak remake. I'm not unaware, and yes, Pokemon Legends Arceus is still a prequel. It's a prequel and a remake. I also wanna say this does not mean you have to like the choices being made that I'm going to lay out, but... But, if you don't want to be surprised or confused when future games come out, or even confused about this game, I think it's important to recognize what's going on. So, what is a Game Freak remake? Well, I think I can safely say we all agree, a Game Freak remake is not a faithful remake. Otherwise, there would not be so many people upset with BDSP. Which means, changes are expected. An unfaithful remake, right? Okay. Stick with me here. So, let's list the typical things we've come to expect in a Game Freak remake. 1. It is made by a Game Freak. 2. The music gets remixed. 3. The same region, but new places too, like the Sevi Islands. 4. Character design changes, most notably the protagonists. Everyone loves those, including me. 5. Except sometimes... They aren't just changes, they're brand new characters like Lyra and Heart Gold Soul Silver, who replace Chris, and important people like Zidia, who aren't even replacing anyone. They're just entirely brand new. Seven, and this is getting in the weeds, but Game Freak remakes are considered separate lore wise from the originals. Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire. Oh, this is a quote. Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire is the mega timeline, right? That's what you guys say? That kind of stuff. Um, eight? Eight or nine, I forget. The same story beats? Yes, but also additional remixes to the story, for a, a lack of a better term, like turning Emerald content into its own unique story with the Delta episode. We can all agree on that list, right? I didn't make anything up, That they exist, that's what they have in common. I also want to point out that Game Freak has gone on record saying they don't like to do the same things with their games every time, and that they try to surprise people. Yellow's anime-influenced 
Black and White 2 are not a third version, but are sequels. Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon are two alternate versions and not a third version. Even between remakes, Fire Red and Leaf Green are very much not the same thing as Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, which changed the gameplay. And even the content in the remakes, like Fire Red and Leaf Green's Semi Islands, are not the same as the way they changed the story in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire's Delta Emerald. Delta episode. Typo. So again, unfaithful is what they do. So let's apply this to Pokemon Legends Arceus. One, it is made by Game Freak. BDSP, although directed by Masuda of Game Freak, is made by Ilka. Two, the music is remixes of Diamond and Pearl's music, which I've been playing throughout this video. Three, although Hisui is before Sinnoh, it is still the same region. If you lay the maps over each other, you are visiting a lot of the exact same places, but in 3D space. Now I know they look different, but keep in mind this is a whole different open zone gameplay style. Kinda like if the entire game was Wild Area. So adapting and combining sections was inevitable. The wilderness wouldn't be too much different regardless if you visited these spots in modern day. Four, this game is where the character design changes actually are, not BDSP. If you want to talk lore, if you remember, you are still Don and Lucas, which means yes, Don and Lucas got a new outfit, a new redesign. But if you want to think of it from a game designer's perspective, on a meta level, all of the ancestors are just pushing redesigns even further. The lore isn't real. The job of redesigning a character still boils down to taking an existing design and making changes for a reason, regardless if it's a multiverse version or an ancestor. We've all seen Marvel movies. Sometimes Spider-Man is blonde or a clone. You're still going into work and redesigning Spider-Man regardless of the lore reason. If you want similar ones, I wrote Candace barely looks different than Candace. Clover barely looks different than Clover. Cynthia got two redesigns. Again, if you want to go back to lore, these two Mays, Oras May and original Red, Ruby and Sapphire May, are not the same person. So it's fine if these three Cynthias are also not the same person. Again, again, Lyra is not even close to the same person as Chris because we all know she's a redesign of Mario. Okay. Actually, I covered a lot of five and six in the last comparison. But yeah, uh, there's, there are new story characters like Zinnia in previous remakes. So it's fine to have brand new characters in Arceus. And lastly, Pokemon Legends Arceus has a lot of the same story beats as Diamond and Pearl. Meeting the same characters, check. Cynthia, Cynthia has a Togepi, check. People confuse Dialga and Palkia, check. Side quest to help a Psyduck's headache, check. Ruin talk with Cynthia, check. Spiritomb quest, check. Sky Pillar Fight, check. Rain Chain, Rain Chain, Red Chain, check. Crazy Sky, check. Lake Guardians Quest, check. Gathering Plates, check. Cynthia Fight, check. Azure Flute, kinda check. It was supposed to be in the original game, but it never got distributed. Now, of course, there's more than just these. And these story beats aren't all the exact same. Some have pretty big changes to them, but that's what I was getting at earlier. Game Freak does not like to do the same things. And a big, big criticism in the past was that either they didn't change enough, which I'm sure many people were thinking when I brought up that Game Freak likes to change things, or that people didn't like the changes, like the Delta episode instead of Emerald content. See where I'm going with this? Pokemon Legends Arceus hits all of the aspects of a Game Freak remake. It's just turning up the new to like full blast. It's an entire game of a Delta episode. So in my opinion, they made Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl to fulfill the other end of people's wants. Two separate experiences, the best of both worlds. And this point is driven even further home with a simultaneous marketing for both games where they basically said to choose between the two. They were four different people who wanted different things out of their remakes. Again, 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 again. I am not saying you have to like any of this. It's perfectly valid to want it the old way. And I don't think BDSP was for me. I struggled to get through it, to be honest. Now, I do think BDSP existing is valid. Diamond and Pearl are Gen 4 to most people, not Platinum. There are improvements in BDSP and there are plenty of other faithful remakes that people love. People love the PS5 Demon Souls remake. But here's the thing, some of the original Demon's Souls fans also had issues with the differences between the original and remake. 
like the change in art style. There just weren't as many people who played the original to cause as big of a hubbub as Gen 4 fans did. This happens with every Faithful remake, like The Last of Us Part 1 that just released. But the reality is, there are still lots of people who want what is essentially a modern day replacement of the original games. Now honestly, I'd take a port over a Faithful remake any day. But the reality is, us original fans are usually old. People like new and want to get that experience without having to go back. Again, I'm not saying you have to like it. I prefer other things. I'm just explaining it. Although, I will take anything Sonic Adventure Remake. I'm, I'm just saying. So what does my original tweet prediction mean? And what does Final Fantasy VII Remake have to do with any of this? Well, if you've played Final Fantasy VII capital R Remake, you will know that yes, it is a remake, but it is also a sequel. A remake sequel using time and space shenanigans and a new gameplay style. Guess what Pokemon Legends is? A prequel, yes. But it is also a remake sequel that uses time and space shenanigans in a new gameplay style. So BDSP is a normal remake of Diamond and Pearl, but Pokemon Legends Arceus is a Pokemon Diamond and Pearl capital R remake. That's it. That's That was the joke. Knowing the lore is so fun. <laughs> I was so stoked during the intro to this game when it all came together. Oh my god! Yes! Oh, I nailed that! <laughs> I want more people to join me to see the light. <laughs> but I hear ya. I hear ya. You've been waiting this entire time to poke one giant hole in my argument. If these stories were so similar between Pokemon Diamond and Pearl and Arceus, why doesn't Legends Arceus have the whole Red Gyarados tie-in from the beginning of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl? That was super important. It's what started the whole thing. Well, what a very specific thing to bring up. All right, I'm just gonna speed through this. We've done this before, you get how it works. Puzzle pieces equals story. In the original Diamond and Pearl, you wake up to the news of Red Gyarados at the Lake of Rage. Want to visit your own lake to see if anything similar is going down, and then bump into Professor Rowan investigating the same lake. This is the beginning of your tale. Well, in Pokemon Legends Arceus, a similar but not quite the same origin story exists. You would assume Commodo, Professor Rowan's ancestor, is from Galar because later on he wears Galarian armor. But I don't think that's the case. I think he just visited Galar. Benny, the ninja, says they grew up in the same town together. Commodo, later on, loses his cool and speaks in an accent in the Japanese version associated with the Kansai region. The Pokemon equivalent of the Kansai region in Japan, because remember, real life is part of the lore, is the Johto region. So, if Commodo is from the Johto region, and Benny and Commodo lived in the same place, and Benny is a ninja, you can make the safe assumption that they grew up in the home of the ninja, Mahogany Town. Now, a little wrinkle in this story is that Benny and Commodo saw their hometown burned to the ground by a Madden Pokemon running amok. This is where everything comes together, because if I'm right about their hometown, right above it is the Lake of Rage, and Gyarados, which live in the lake, are known to tear down villages. Benny and Commodo lost people that day, which is the whole reason they moved to Hisui to start anew. The beginning of their tale. We can even add a bit of environmental storytelling to this. Because if you walk up to Commodo's office, he has a photo of who I assume is his wife, who is nowhere to be seen. Future Taco here. Um, I just had a, a, a brain blast, an epiphany. And so we're just going to look at my 3,585 photos of Pokemon Legends Arceus. Go back quite a ways. You can see the little scroll bars all the way at the bottom. Because I remembered they changed the statue models on top of the uh, Galaxy Hall building from a Gyarados to a Magikarp. That's why. They did it because he didn't want it to be a Gyarados anymore. Oh, oh, I get it. I get it. Because this is kind of a weird detail, right? There's a model of the Gyarados sculpture on it. Perhaps it's an earlier design for Galaxy Hall. 
And then there's a sketch of a magic carp too. Perhaps it's part of the plans for the galaxy hall. Oh, oh, oh. He didn't want like the thing that um, gave him a bad time in his past to be the symbol of his galaxy hall, right? So they changed it to a magic carp. Anyways, uh, yeah. Um, uh, uh, back to the video. If at the end of all of this, you still don't believe me that Pokemon Legends Arceus is not only a prequel, but a remake and a sequel, maybe you'll take Pokemon's official word for it. I did not find this until I started doing research for this video. So I understand if you didn't either, but while I was streaming my reaction to the announcement, Pokemon tweeted out an announcement tweet for Pokemon Legends Arceus that straight up calls it a pre-make. They aren't allowed to make stuff up, especially for an announcement tweet. So now we've arrived at the final story section. This one is hard. I don't have all the answers. I don't think we're supposed to have all the answers yet, but I'd like to do my best. This is gonna be complicated. Out of all the sections, this one is really going to require you to have knowledge of the game because explaining every aspect from scratch would require me explaining the whole game. So consider this the true test of your observation skills. The final boss, if you will. If you have played Pokemon Legends Arceus, you'll know that you can dig up old verses. These old verses tell a story, but that story is very cryptic and we'll take most of the observation tools we have to piece together. Even after we piece it together, I don't think I'll have all the answers, but we're gonna try anyways. There are 20 old verses in total, and despite being numbered, seem to be chronologically out of order. So first we're gonna tackle this by process of elimination on what seems to matter and what doesn't. Old verse six, 15, 18, and 19 are repeats of the Sinnoh myth books and folk tales from gen four. So we're skipping them with the assumption these were simply passed down from the ancient Sinnoh people before the author. That might not be accurate, but me not knowing everything is part of the fun. You can all join in and give input if you want. Old verse 13 is about potato mochi and eight is about the plates. So we're skipping those two. Now, let's start building the story, beginning with verse 12. Wintry austere, brimming with strange power. Certainly the land of Hisui bears some resemblance to Shinjo. Here where the ancient Sinnoh people were born, I will spend eternity until the one with the mission appears. I'm just gonna spoil it now. It is said all of the old verses are written by one person, and that person seems to be Kagita. More than one example seems to imply that Kagita has a really, really long lifespan. This is implied when she gives you an amorous, Pokemon that you don't need to worry about giving back to her because when you eventually die, Enamorous will return to her. She is also likely a descendant of the Sinnoh people. Additionally, this is hinted at by the color of her house being green. Hisui, if you did not know, is not a made up Pokemon name. It actually means Jade. In fact, in Japan, it's the Jade region. If blue is for the Diamond Clan and pink is for the Pearl Clan, then it's a solid bet that the green stands for the color of the original people of Sinnoh, or Team Arceus. It's also the original three Pokemon colors, pink, you know, being a stand in for red. Uh, you know who also dons green and is a descendant of the ancient Sinnoh people? With that in mind, returning to verse 12, Wintry Austere, brimming with strange power. Certainly the land of Hisui bears some resemblance to Sinjo. Here, where the ancient Sinnoh people were born, I will spend eternity until the one with the mission appears. From this verse alone, we can learn quite a lot. It sounds as though Kagita actually comes from Shinjo, a location that ties Johto and Sinnoh together that we see in Heart Gold, Soul Silver, but that she is not quite as old as the ancient, ancient Sinnoh people from thousands of years before that she is the descendant of. But she does say, here, I will spend eternity which is true so far. The location this verse was found in, the Alabaster Icelands, is also another piece of the puzzle. This is where she will start waiting for you, the player, as her mission. The mission she says she can finally complete when she meets you in the present day ancient retreat. 
We know you are the mission because when you meet her at the ancient retreat, she says, quote, Ah, oh, the poor wretch you spoke of. Lost in time and space. Dear me. Lost one. It seems I'll be able to fulfill my duty at long last. Thanks to you. Do you guys love my accent? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Side note. I just said her mission takes place in the Alabaster Icelands, but she lives in the ancient retreat in present day. I believe this might be a parallel to Cynthia living outside of Celestic Town, where her family live, which, if you look at the map of both Sinnoh and Hisui, seems to be what the ancient retreat, like retreat as in vacation, turned into. So the real original home base seems to be the Alabaster Icelands, but Kagita got out of there. She even travels around with an amorous. Let's continue with verse 3 and 10. 3. No claws, no fangs, no strength to claim. No man could hope to hold his own to mighty Pokemon. But bolts of light rained down. One day, ten times they fell. Ten times they struck true upon ten Pokemon. Then to weak man did these ten turn his strength to be. And all were blessed by loyal Pokemon. Were not these bolts a gift to man? Were they not your almighty grace, great Seno Paragon? And then ten. T'was long ago he earned the name Hero. He led his retune. Ten Pokemon against the almighty unknowable. In battle did his valiance proclaim at last the strength of humble humankind. The great unknowable approved this feat and to its domain of no place returned. So what happened here, we learn about through events in present day. This is the original event with the ancient hero everyone talks about all the time with the original 10 Noble and Ride Pokemon. Who is this hero? Well, with context clues and environmental storytelling and the fact that everyone thinks this guy is so cool no matter which clan it is, it's safe to say it's the older looking guy that everyone has a shared portrait of. Notice he is also wearing green. So what exactly is he a hero of? Well, reading verse three, it starts the conflict. No man could hope to hold his own against mighty Pokemon. Now, in the ancient days, according to Sinnoh folklore, Pokemon were our friends. So something is going wrong here for the Pokemon to be attacking. The same thing is happening in present day history. The alpha Pokemon. Arceus is the one who sent the Bolts of Lightning to Super Saiyan, the 10 Noble and Ride Pokemon, but that does not account for all the other angry Pokemon. Well, this story overlaps with both the present day and what is written on the Arceus plates. If you read the spooky plate, it says, The other side of this world was given by the original one, Arceus, to its raging third. And the Zap plate says, the third being raged, raining down bolts of anger. So if it wasn't clear... Sorry. <laughs> Arceus isn't the only one who was able to shoot influential bolts of lightning. Garatina can too. Reading verse 10 again, with this context, "'Twas long ago he earned the name Hero. He led his retune, ten Pokemon, against the almighty unknowable. In battle did his valiance proclaim at last the strength of humble humankind. The great unknowable approved this feat, and to its domain of no place returned. So, this is the inciting incident. This is the defeat of a raging Garatina. This mirrors what is happening currently too. All of the raging alpha Pokemon? That's Garatina's doing. The noble Pokemon glow gold with Arceus' halo as a test. But the Alpha Pokemon all have the same glowing red eyes whoa, as Giratina. The original incident is why Giratina was banished, and is why we see its statue broken. This is why the characters in Arceus are having back and forth on whether or not the lightning is dangerous. The Alpha Pokemon seem to be an attack, but Arceus' bolts seem to be a test, something supported by the Pokemon anime when Cynthia mentions Arceus gives hits but does not directly intervene. Both of these verses can actually be found in the Cobalt Coastlands, which is the same area as Turnback Cave, Giratina's non-underworld home. So why is this happening again? More on that later. Let's continue with Old Verse 16 and 11. 
16. Heaven's crown, near is the almighty Sinnoh. Power of almighty Sinnoh, gather as stone at heaven's mount. Stone, let your power flow. Distort and bend the world around you. And 11. Let our wishes reach heaven's crown. The people together vowed. So they and their Pokemon bore stone to the peak of heaven's mount. The people carved the gathered stones in the shapes of Pokemon. The ten Pokemon that Sinnoh shone its almighty light upon. So this is the creation of the Temple of Sinnoh, which later became the Spear Pillar. And it seems like the Pokemon statues you encounter in Hisui are actually made out of... Originor? Uh, the verses say the stones have the powers of Sinnoh, and that's what Originor is, so... Cool. I... I... I guess someone should really pick up some of that rubble. Also, I want to point out that Hisuian Electrode should not exist at this point, at least in this form, because Pokeballs don't exist, right? They're like mimics. The things around the necks of the people in the portraits are not the same wooden Pokeballs, if they even are Pokeballs. So Electrode, they might not be, by the way. So Electrode shouldn't look like that, right? Unless you remember that a time and space portal showed up during this confrontation too. I don't know if that's actually the correct interpretation of the puzzle pieces, but again, you know, that's the fun, right? It's, it's an unsolved collection of information. All right, old verse one. Once there were two, and one looked upon time's steady pace, and one looked upon the expanse of space, and the two set out the fullest of future did they seek. The world's far end would they greet, Two different paths, each walking alone, a path of their own. Though they walk with almighty Sinnoh. Pretty sure this is about the ancestors of the Team Aqua and Magma leaders, who clearly set up the Diamond and Pearl clans. The clans that split Sinnoh into a belief of time or space. They also ended up on different sides of the region, or in the verse's fancy words, the world's far end would they greet. But this is where things take a turn, with old verse 20. Once it shone upon us all, with all the warmth of the welcome sun. But now we weep, to grief we fall. Starved of light, now it has gone. And some they go, despair with all. In search of it, they reel and run. They quit their hearths, abandon hall, and leave our lands to be undone. And when they're gone, beyond recall, this land will be a home to none. This land will only ever be a home to Pokemon. So, this one I got 80% the gist of. But it wasn't until the YouTuber Pokephrase2 pointed out that the older looking character looked like a son, did it all click. This is the death of our ancient hero? Sun is metaphorical, and this is what grief caused the ancient Sinnoh people to leave their Alabaster Iceland's village. Now, I don't know if this is the same thing, but there is a quest you can take to find a lost village for a member of the Ginkgo Guild in the Icelands, and there, on that quest, you discover a green torn journal. Looks like the Ginkgo Guild might have had a few descendants of the ancient Sinnoh people among them, but uh, that's just another guess for now, along with the Voltorb thing, the Electrode thing, right? It's just a guess for now. This next collection of verses likely are not in order, but are the ramifications of the ancient hero no longer being around, and Kagita continuing to live for a very, very long time, with verse 4, 14, 5, and 9. 4. Ten Pokemon, the ancient hero's loyal retune. Though these companions now are gone, their noble duty passes on to generations new. The people thank the ten descendants for their generous toil by lined vessels built to last with water clear and choice repast before the arena soil. Rep repast is food. I had to look that up. I had to look that up. So it's the descendants looking after the noble Pokemon, right? 14. The fieldlands rush by under hoof as weird dare carries me astride. Companions of mine run with us in Pokemon Dash alongside. We come to stand where wind had swept and old days play before my eyes. The memories come running through 
linking this place to times gone by. Time and space here bend together and enfold my heart as I remember. All right, five. And that's pretty self-explanatory. She's, she's remembering, right? Five. Long and longer yet ago, Celestica was here, but folk and town alike both did disappear. In time came new folk sailing, sailing across the sea, called by their love for Sinnoh, great and almighty. But different were the Sinnoh that each folk did hold dear, and better strife and angry war were always at the near. Celestica, they called themselves, the name not theirs to take, yet claim it from the past they did for tragic quarrel's sake. So once again did our name live, Though all our people's gone, but even if the name endures, the hearts does not live on. Its hearts does not live on. I'm not going to go back. This one is interesting because this not only reveals that the ancient people were the Celestica people, you know, as in Celestic town in modern day, where Cynthia's family lives, which you can find ruins of, not the, t not the town, the ancient people ruins. But it also shows that the Diamond and Pearl clan aren't the ancient Sinnoh people. This verse is also found near the same location, the Cobalt Coastlands, where all of the destroyed boats are. A tragic quarrel indeed. On a related note, the Cobalt Coastlands are where the Ginkgo Landing exists, which implies this is where the Ginkgo Guild goes back and forth for trading. Continuing on. Nine. I set the bones of Pokemon adrift upon the river. I let my memories flow on. Adrift upon the river. And to the ocean they will flow, perhaps around the world they go. How many bones and days now gone have I now set adrift from me? How many bones and days to come will I yet set adrift to sea, while every gift with which I part takes a sliver of my heart? So if taken literally, which is the only way I'm going to take it, this seems to be about Kagita outliving her companions. At this point, I believe she is at the ancient retreat, which has a river, and this grieving she is feeling might explain her choice of wearing black, which is often associated with funeral wear. In fact, once she completes her mission, passing on her knowledge to you, she happily decides that maybe it's time for a change in fashion at Jubilife's Clothier. It's wild to me how much fits together once you start finding these little, like, seemingly separate pieces. These, like, one lines. I think that is... So cool. And sort of lastly, there's others, but in sort of lastly, verse two. Oh, you, who at the world's far off and dwell, I know your wish, it is mine as well. My own beloved is now gone from me, departed to a place I cannot reach. My old companions have left me behind, their faces faded into days gone by. Still to my breast, I clutch this hopeless dream. A futile wish for us to once more meet. Oh, you at the world's far off end dwell, I know your wish, it is mine as well. But ours are cold and endless winter days, warmed only by memories, blocked away. All right, so this one is kind of confusing to unpack. Let's start with the easy confirmation that worlds, worlds far off and dwell likely is Alabaster Islands, where the Pearl Clan live, and not some other region. Because this verse is located in the Crimson Mirelands, where the Diamond Clan live, and Kagita mentions endless winter days. Now, who is she lamenting to? Well, I didn't know, but Poke Phrase 2 came in and saved the day again by suggesting it might be Reggie Gigas. Sounds weird? Yeah, it does. But according to the Flame Plate, the power of defeated giants infuses this plate. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Which seems to imply Reggie Gigas, who lives in the Alabaster Icelands, has lived long and lost many too. So let me read that again with the new context. Oh you, who at the world's far off and dwell, I know your wish, it is mine as well. My own beloved is now gone from me, departed to a place I cannot reach. My old companions have left me behind. Their faces faded into days gone by. Still to my breast I clutch this hopeless dream, a futile wish for us once more to meet. O oh, you who at the world's far off end dwell, I know your wish, it is mine as well. But ours are cold and endless winter days, warmed only by memories locked away. 
suddenly it makes a lot more sense. But there is one more mystery in this verse. Who is Kagita's beloved? Now, it doesn't seem like multiple Pokemon because my own beloved is now gone for me sounds singular. So the only notable person we know from this time frame really seems to imply it might have been the ancient hero who died. Here's the thing. We don't know what happened to the ancient hero. We know he looks like Alder, but who's to say he's not Alder? It could also be an ancestor. I don't know. Maybe he died. Maybe he got sucked through a time and space distortion. Maybe there's a reason Alder is a Unova character, and there is a location in Unova called the Cave of Bean, a place where people say the deepest part of the cave leads to the Sinnoh region. Sorry, that was the end of the quote. I don't know why I feel like that. Maybe we're not supposed to know yet. Maybe this isn't the end of the story. There seems to be a lot of Gen 5, aka Unova connections in this game. The forces of nature, aside from Enamorous, who we find out traveled to Hisui uh, in another verse just because they didn't like the cold, are implied to have possibly come to the Hisui region because of time and space distortions. Maybe they came through them. Ingo, who did come from Gen 5's Unova specifically, does seem to miss his brother which sure sounds like an open story thread to me. There's also Clay from Unova's ancestor. Despite being in the Hisui region, sports a cowboy hat. Does that mean we'll get a Unova Legends game in the Old West? I don't know. <laughs> I mean like, and also, you know, Gen 4 comes after Gen 5. The point is, heck, one of the points of this entire video is there is more Pokemon story than people realize. That's the title unless I changed it. And not only is it consistent, but it's cross-generation. There are probably many solvable answers that I missed, but there are definitely answers we're not supposed to know yet that will be saved for future games. So let's apply everything we know and make a timeline out of all this. Close your eyes. Imagine a timeline because I am not going to spend the time drawing one. The furthest in the past is the ancient Celestica Sinnoh folk. Fast forward a bunch of time and Kagita shows up from Sinjo, also an ancient Celestica person, just thousands of years younger, up in the Alabaster Icelands with a mission to live a very long time and pass on knowledge to you in the future. Then Giratina gets mad and rebels against Arceus, making a bunch of Pokemon angry. Arceus sends the humans, more specifically the ancient hero, a test by Zeus zapping 10 Pokemon. The ancient hero wins against Giratina, sending him back to the Shadow Realm and the people create the Temple of Sinnoh with statues of said 10 Pokemon. They also crush a Giratina statue. Fast forward to the Diamond and Pearl Clan split off. Everyone dies except Kagita. Kagita might have loved someone, maybe the ancient hero. And then sometime relatively recently, Volo shows up. This is where I'm gonna be inserting a little bit more new information. Volo wants to meet Arceus. He's obsessed. Have you seen his hair? He then conspires with Garatina, who wants revenge against Arceus. So Garatina is super down. At this point, they are gaining strength and starting to create small holes in space-time. Which is why in Hisuian Snow, the canon anime, we have an alpha Pokemon before the big Mount Cornet space-time hole opens up. Along the way, potentially at the beginning of this process, at least 10 years ago, one of the holes seems to have brought Ingo. We know this because of the art book. It shows him like on the ground, it has XX years ago unless it was something completely different that brought him here, because Alec and company hadn't seen any time and space distortions a little over 10 years before your present day. Insert all of the stuff where Alec potentially inspired the survey crew, and now, right before you arrive, there's a chance Volo is the one who killed Arcanine. During that storyline, it is said that shadowy figures were seen on Firespit Island, and none matched this description better than Giratina. In fact, the only unique Pokemon Volo has compared to Cynthia is his Hisuian Arcanine. Interesting. The last incident leading up to your arrival is Giratina finally becoming strong enough to rip a hole in space-time above Mount Cornet. But because Volo wasn't the chosen one who brought the plates, they were unsuccessful. Although they did anger Palka and Dialga in the process leading to the events of Pokemon Legends Arceus. What the heck, bro? <laughs> there is one final, 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 final story, however, and it seems to be that Kogita might not be the only long-lived person. Not only does Volo threaten to keep at it for centuries in his final speech, but taking into consideration how long he's potentially been conspiring with Garantina, this one seemingly throwaway line felt peculiar. 
and I did not put it in the thing. Oh, crud! I didn't put it in the thing. Hold on. I'll put the screenshot on the screen. But Volo says, I couldn't help but wonder why life was so unfair. Why I was cursed to live through such things. Volo might be younger than Kagita, but that doesn't mean he isn't going to live as long. He does have ancient Sinnoh blood, after all. This, just like with Kagita, seemingly took a toll on him, living as long as he has. Because now he wants to remake the world, which sounds awfully familiar. And there you have it! We did it! You all see what I see now. So where do we go next? Well, there's still huge mysteries I haven't figured out. Like, one of the verses I didn't read earlier had something about wiping your memory if you didn't answer one of the Lake Spirit's quizzes correctly. Is, is that what happened to Ingo? Because that's where he dropped. I don't know. Uh, I thought all you had to do was drop through the portal to not have your memories. I don't know. Or, what about the hieroglyphs? What do they actually say? They clearly say something. And no, I don't mean Volo's summary of them. I mean, like, they specifically say something. But I spent a heck of a lot of time trying to figure it out. I did not figure it out. So, if someone else wants to do that, have at it. I don't even know if it's in English. But, your eyes, they've been opened. That hardly anything in Pokemon is an accident. Unless it is an accident. That they those exist too. There's still a bunch of other unsolved mysteries. Like, in the concept art, Mai's, Mai has an Ursa ring that she's like hanging out with and it's on her clothes. But where's that in the game? Uh, the shoes I've been wearing in a lot of the footage, they're, they're like mystery items, just like the Rotom was, the Rotom stuff was. Um, uh, uh, I don't know. There's other stuff, I'm sure. I, I don't know. I don't know. There's probably so much left, but that's the thing. That's why I'm creating the lore library. That is why I'm inviting people to come hang out with me and participate. Your eyes have hopefully been opened at this point that this stuff exists and it does exist in other games. Like I said, Sonic fans know it exists in Sonic, right? Uh, you know, maybe maybe not as uh, connected, which is why we're excited that it's connected now, right? Maybe not as connected, but it's there and they see it and I see it with Pokemon and I want to share that with people and I want people to join me. Uh, the lore library is basically just a giant book club, right? Um, the, the Discord is just there for my notes. You don't have to be in the Discord, um, the patron-only Discord. Uh, it'd be nice if you were, but it, it's just there for my notes. The only thing you're missing out on, which I think is actually a kind of a big thing you're missing out on, is uh, watch parties, right? Or or stuff that isn't streamable, like if we're reading a manga, right? That, that Those notes and those, like, you know, together moments or whatever will happen there. So, like, joint research, right? Otherwise, it's just a list. It's like a, just a giant to-do list of le learning everything and everything that's like extended past it. So, if we're learning about Pokemon, we'll, we'll play everything that inspired Pokemon, right? We'll read Dragon Ball, like, right? We'll we'll go through everything that led up to Pokemon and then also play Pokemon. Um, the cool thing about it being a book club is that we're going to treat every game like they're brand new. There's not going to be any spoilers, right? We're going to pretend like no one's ever played these games before and we're going to play... Um, with open minds, because I think I think if you go into a game with like preconceived notions, you miss things a lot of times, right? Like, oh, this game is like this, so then you miss how it wasn't like that, right? That's a very poor example. Um, what else in the lower library? Uh, streams. Uh, the videos. I don't want to force videos. I don't think I'll have something to say out of ever uh, at the end of every series I play. I don't think I'll have something profound to say. I care more about learning about it, which is why it's a lore library, right? I care more about learning about it than I care about, you know, becoming a YouTuber, right? Which is a big reason I didn't, wasn't a YouTuber before now. Um, I have maybe, in my entire lifetime, I have maybe a total of seven video ideas right now. And I'm sure I'll come up with a few more as we do the lore library, because it's a huge list of stuff to do, right? Maybe like 10 or 15 max or whatever, right? Um, but the goal is... I, I want to, I want more people like me. <laughs> That's really it. I want more people like me. I want more people that just care about this stuff and, you know, learn about the developers and the people behind the games and all that other stuff. I, I you know, game history, right? Like, the big, the big name developers, they're all getting old now. 
you know? Let's enjoy this stuff and, and appreciate this stuff while everyone is still around. Because, <laughs> you know, uh, gaming is just finally becoming not young. Right? It's, it's, it, it, people are always like, oh, the game industry is young. I think we're, uh, that threshold of young is about to close, right? Anyways, join my Patreon, join the lore library, join us in our book clubs, join us in our watch parties. Uh, the video ideas are going to be about a bunch of different games. There's going to be some surprises, so sub to this channel. It's not going to be lore, like, it's not going to be lore dumps like this every single time. There's going to be tons of lore. Uh, I'm just gonna say it now. Uh, my Gen 1 Pokemon video is gonna be my... Probably everything will lead up to that. It'll be the 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 thing that I know I can bring to the table that no one else can, right? That's gonna be my... Not ultimatum. What's it called? I don't know. Anyways, I've been talking for a really long time. Um, if you... If you stuck around this long, I just want to tell you. Pokemon have always been the ones that shrink. The Pokeball doesn't do the shrinking. Pokemon are the ones shrinking. Ever since the very beginning, in Gen 1, there is a book that has ancient Pokemon lore in it. And it says Pokemon shrink. In the, in the Deoxys, I think, Pokemon Generations episode, they find out Deoxys is, a po Deoxys is a Pokemon because it shrinks. They're like, oh, it, it goes in the Pokeball. It's a Pokemon. It's not the Pokeball making it go in there. It's the Pokemon being able to go into the Pokeball that makes it a Pokemon. Pokemon, because there's a lot of people were confused during Legends Arceus when the professor was like, yeah, Pokemon have the ability to shrink. They're like, what? It's always been that way. If you join me in seeing the light you will know pokemon have always shrunk Okay, we're, we're healing our Pokemon right now. That's all we're doing. We're healing our Pokemon right now. Actually? Come on, hang in there, Crobat. Okay, 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 okay. I get I get two shots off. We're hypnosis we're hypnosising the crud out of this guy right now. Oh wait, oh I thought it didn't hit. Okay, okay. Yeah, go to sleep, go to sleep, go to sleep, go to sleep. This is our chance. All right, we are healing somebody. I don't know who. <laughs> um, we're gonna heal Sprite, cause then we can paralyze him if he wakes up. Go to sleep. Yes, yes. All right. Oh God, he's gonna get a bunch of. He's gonna get two shots off in a second. Uh, we can stop him from getting two shots off if we bite him. Yeah, well, let's bite him. Yeah, let's bite him. Okay, we're gonna bite him. Okay, we're biting him. Hi, Jack. Oh, and he's asleep. <laughs> Sucks to be you. Can I catch him? No. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um. I guess we'll just do another bite. All right, Crobat, bite him again. Oh, he's still asleep. <laughs> uh, oh, I can hit, I can bite you twice. Yeah, I'll bite you twice. My Crobat's just chomping on him. Oh my gosh, he doesn't stand a chance. Bite him again. <laughs> oh my god, and he's asleep. <laughs> All right, let's let's bite him one big one, one big finale bite. 
Oh, that was very funny. We didn't even need a backup Pokemon. Oh. What? <laughs> no! No! <laughs> oh no! Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> Okay, maybe we didn't need a backup Pokemon. Alright, alright, alright.